and welcome everyone to our first program in 2024, Perf Web 97. Welcome. Um, and there you go. We're going to camera three. I am your host, Joe Basha. Now, a little, just a quick note. We were going to be joined by Becky Bulkovac, but she's putting an ECMO in. Thomas DeSalvio is coming in her stead, and we're also going to be bringing Vicki Carlisle in remotely. But anyway, I'm really excited. We're starting our 2024 series right now, and uh, let's get through the opening remarks, and we'll talk about all this other stuff. So again, I'm Joe Basha. You want to reach out to me, you want to talk to me, you want to send me an email, it's contact at perfusioneducation.com. You see it right there. Yeah, you want to suggest a comment, you can also call in, be live on the air, 832-239-35. I'm sorry, I have dyslexia here. 832-239-5358. That's 832-239-5358. And here's our scroll bar. You see it down below. It's on continuously through the program as well as our telephone number. So you want to give us a call in the middle of the program, ask a question. We also have the YouTubes. We have the Facebooks. We have X. I don't have to say Twitter anymore. And we have our internal and also the LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn. So you could be watching us on any of those platforms. Now, the American board, I talked with them real quick. I'll get to the app in just one second. I, that's okay. You could leave it up if you'd like, and they can see it. That's fine. Um, and they've asked that we do a, uh, a sign-in. So we need to do, I guess, a roll call, if you will. So what I need you to do, whether you're on YouTube or you're on X or you're on FaceTime, whichever LinkedIn, whichever it is, in the chat section, please go ahead and put your name if you are going to be claiming this for category one CEU, that's going to be a requirement. Also, I need to let you know that at the end of the program, you will have an hour. Um, is it an hour magic or 30 minutes? I don't remember. Is it an hour or 30 minutes before they have to, to, to test? Yeah. Which is it an hour or 30 minutes? Uh, one, hour. one hour. So you have one hour to take the uh, the uh, the survey, the uh, the uh, uh, evaluation so that you can uh, get the credits for this. So we just asked, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. Thank you, Carly. I appreciate that as well. Or uh, yeah, Carly. So I appreciate that. Thank you. So anyway, these are some of the new changes that have taken place. I've worked with the board this year to make sure that we're staying completely compliant and everybody gets the credits that uh, they've earned. Okay. So moving on from there, our app, our critical care perfusion app, probably one of the best apps ever developed. Um, it's only $2.99. I joke about it all the time, but you know, it's really a good app. I use it. You have a perfusion section with perfusion quick calcs. You have an ECMO section. You have a hemodynamic section. You have a calculator section. You also have an IV dose rate calculator, which is also a separate app. If you go to the uh, app store or you go to Google store, you'll find it on there. And so nurses in the ICU that use it find it very helpful. Um, very good for physicians, uh, advanced practice uh, providers, APPs, um, but really good for perfusionists as well. So check our app out, see what you think, let us know. And then next is our podcast. You can listen to our programs uh, on whatever your favorite podcast streaming uh, platform is, and you can find us there uh, in PerfWeb, okay? And I believe that wraps it all up. I don't think there's anything else. Um, so that's good. All right. So as I said, my co-host today, uh, Becky Bulkovac, she's really busy doing a uh, an emergency ECMO uh, insertion. We've been very busy. It's been a uh, it's been a challenging year already, and it's just getting started. But we do have some folks hired, so I'm really excited about that. So I think we're going to be able to spend some more time investing in these programs to make them even better and bring you some unique content that you might not find other places. The topic for my uh, uh, lectures today, the program today is actually the ABCs of ABGs. And uh, that's the first part. And then we're gonna be talking about uh, uh, pH stat and alpha stat for uh, profound hypothermia, circulatory rest, or just for hypo hypothermia. Now, what I did was I went out, because I feel like I know a fair amount of blood, about blood gases, 
And uh, I have to say that my co-host, Vicki Carlisle, can you bring Vicki up? Can she come up? You got to bring her up. There she is. Hey, Vic, I think you need to move just a little bit to get centered a little better. There you go. There you yeah, It's almost in the center. There you go. A little more to your left. A little more to your left. A little more. Keep going left. Keep going left. Keep going left. A little more. Th two more inches. Or turn the screen, whichever you want to do, the camera. Um, anyway, welcome. It's good to see you. The other way. Other way. Almost. Okay. Maybe you can call her magic and help her. It's perfect. You're perfect. You're perfect in every way. Anyway, my dear friend, Vicky, colleague, Vicky said, uh, Joe, um, you know, there's, there's basically, there's, there's only four things on one slide for ABGs you could put on there, right? There's this, there's that, and there's mix this, or there's mix that. I was like, no, no, I think it'd be a great lecture. So I went out and I bought this book. Okay. And, uh, and I started reading this book. And after I got to about page two, I said, you know, Vicki, you were right. So I took a little bit of a, a turn on this lecture, but we still are going to focus on ABGs. And there's going to actually be a fun test uh, final exam after the lecture. And anyone that can get some of these questions right are going to get some cool prizes. Okay. Now, if you're out of the country, I got to tell you, I have sent now the second time a whole bunch of stuff up to one of our dear colleagues up in Canada, um, a, uh, I can't remember the name, Kr Krasha Patel, I think. And if you're on, by the way, say hello or something, but I upped in Calgary and, uh, I mean, I sent cups and some wine goblets and it was like $65. She never got them. So I sent them again for another six. You better get them this time. It's all I can tell you. But anybody out of the country gets something from Amazon that you can get online. You get some kind of a gift certificate. I can't mail stuff out of the country anymore. It's too painful. Uh, with immigration customs and all of that. Uh, immigration, yeah, wine goblets probably need immigration. Okay, so let's get forward. Basic outline, um, blood gases and fluid balance and electrolytes, really these things are all um, to some degree interconnected. Oops, I think I messed up. I'm sorry, forgive me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. I see you're trying to save me from myself. But oncotic pressure is defined as the osmotic pressure exerted by colloids in solution. So the term COP, which we used to measure COP all of the time. Where'd Vicky go? Uh, COP all the time and oncotic pressure can be used interchangeably. Essentially, colloid oncotic pressure a commonly used misnomer is redundant, right? Because it can't be oncotic if it's not colloidal. Osmolality, on the other hand, is the concentration of osmotically active particles as a solute per kilogram of solution. Hey, Dave, is Vicky around? No? No, we don't, I don't, we don't see her. Okay, so... We're going to look at that. We're going to look at normal acid-base balance. We're going to look at uh, some electrolyte interaction and uh, the interconnectivity of these acid-base disorders along with the electrolytes. So let's start with the fluid section. And I put this up here. I think it has some value just as a point of reference, right? The right atrial pressure, RV, LA, uh, LV, the PA, the wedge, and the aortic pressure. We're all very familiar with these. We know what these pressures are, but these are normal. You know, it's pretty unusual for us to see somebody in the OR having heart surgery anymore with a CVP of, uh, unless they're on bypass already, of, of, of five or a, uh, an LVEDP of uh, zero to 12, more like, uh, you know, 18 to 24. So that's something that was especially valvular uh, patients. So we're all familiar with this curve. Basically, what this curve says is the more volume we put into the heart, the higher the stroke volume until you reach a certain point, and then, boom, it falls off, and you are unable to uh, increase your stroke volume for any aliquot of, uh, of volume in the heart. In advanced heart failure, of course, that happens very quickly. They're very volume-sensitive people. I think we all know that. But anyway, first question, I'm going to throw it up there and if anybody can text it in and it'll just, it'll go towards credit. But what's the name of this curve? 
and Vicki Carlisle, you're allowed to answer as well. So if you know, just raise your hand and we'll get everybody a chance to type their answer in. I know you know it. Everybody knows it. So I want to start off with everybody starting with the first question right. Okay, that should be enough time. Vicki? Okay, that's, that's, and, and, and that's good um, on uh, uh, Mr. Campbell. But what's the first name? Has to be the full name. First name, got to have that. Vicki, what is it? No cheating. Thanks, Starling's Curve. No, that's good, but you have that full name, first name. Frank, Frank. Starling. J Jeffrey got it correct. Frank Starling. Because there's a few Starlings out there. But in this case, it's Frank Starling. Okay, let's take a look at body water compartments. For a normal average 70 kilo male, which is pretty unusual to find again in today's day, unless you're out of the country. In the United States, that's very hard to find. We hold about 42 liters of total body water. That is divided up with 28 liters of it, more than half, being intracellular and about 14 liters being extracellular. Now, if you take the extracellular volume, this volume right here, and we go over to this section, that gets further divided up with interstitial, which is about 10.5 liters, and plasma, which is the liquid portion of blood, right? We all know we have red blood cells and platelets and blah, 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 blah. Those are all solids but our liquid portion of our blood is about 3.5 liters. And I realize that may be rudimentary for some of you, but please just bear with me if you don't mind. Um, so there's a lot of volume, and I have actually seen patients that had an excess total body fluid volume, and I'm very, I have to be very careful and very specific with how I discuss fluid overload and hyper and hypovolemia or fluid or, or, or being dry, all of these terms, which we'll talk about here as we move forward. But I've seen somebody that was 28 liters positive in fluid. And it's amazing at how much fluid can be hidden in this interstitial space. Now you see it because they're so they're anasarchic. They're so grossly edematous. They don't even look human, but that is something to, to, to take into consideration. You can stuff a lot of volume in the interstitial space. So that's basically the division of volume that we're talking about. And the question is, how does the water portion of our blood stay where it belongs. Well, there's a balance between hydrostatic, osmotic, and oncotic forces. There's a continuous exchange between the intravascular space and the interstitial space. And of course, that's where you have the lymphatic system to take back anything that doesn't get reabsorbed, and we'll talk about that. And then the intracellular compartments and the extracellular compartments also intermingle, exchange fluids. Focusing on the intravascular space, total protein, specifically albumin, is a large oncotic force that is responsible for the PRR. The PRR is the plasma refill rate. Now, cellular exchange is largely osmotic. Okay. So I want to show you some common fluids that we look at, that we deal with that are on here. And osmolar, oh, is it changing on the screen? I'm so sorry. Osmolarity is an estimation of the osmolar concentration of plasma and is proportional to the number of particles per liter of solution. It is expressed as millimoles per liter. This is what is used when a calculated value is derived. 
and it's derived from sodium, potassium, urea, glucose concentrations. The osmolarity, though, is unreliable in some various conditions. Pseudohyponatremia, for one, and hyperlipidemia uh, in nephrotic, nephrotic syndrome is another, as well as in some hyperproteinemic states. But there is a calculation. The following calculation or equation can be used to estimate, calculate and estimate osmolarity. It's basically two times the sodium, two times the potassium, plus the glucose, plus the urea, all in millimoles per liter. And you get about 275, 295, which is considered normal. Okay. I'm going to zoom this up a little bit to look at these these right here to make it a little clearer for people there. So these are some common crystalloids that we deal with. You have plasmalite A. Um, we use this all the time, especially in the operating room for priming that enormousol R. Those are two of our sort of go-tos, and they're both ex essentially exact. There's not much difference between the two. And you have an osmolarity of 295, you, sodium is 140, chloride is 98, potassium is at 5, and magnesium is at 3. And it is an acetate-buffered solution, not a bicarb-based solution, which makes a very big difference. And it has a little bit of gluconate in it. Um, for if it, you add the dextrose to it, you see you make it more hypertonic. Sodium comes down, the chloride comes down, um, and the potassium goes way up. So that's that enormous solar. I don't really use this, have never really used it before, but it's there. So I'm going to leave that. Um, the enormous salt M and 5% dextrose, I've never used that. The Hartman solution or uh, Ringer's lactate, that's got a, 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 a osmolality of 273, a little lower on the sodium, a little higher on the chloride, a little lower on the potassium, and it's got the lactate. Uh, D5W, we generally don't use that in perfusion, but I know you guys do in the uh, ICU nursing world, and you can see that it is a little bit on the hypotonic side. You've got quarter normal, you've got uh, 0.9, and you have your standard solution. So when you do Z-buff, if you do Z-buff or CVVH, and you're not using a bar bicarb-based solution, in the ice in the operating room where well, you can't use plasma light because that's got potassium in it you want to get the potassium off uh, many people will use sodium chloride in order to hemoconcentrate the patient and to replace the fluid being it was a z them or do cvvh the problem that you see is your sodium ends up going up and because this is buffered with acetate, not bicarb, your bicarb level level goes down. We all know that because you got to treat it and you're treating it with sodium bicarb. So you're giving additional sodium here and you're getting addition, giving additional sodium there as well. Then, of course, you have hypertonic saline, 3%. And if you had somebody that was severely hyponatremic, you would give that. But of course, very slowly, you cannot uh, correct potassiums rapidly. That can be uh, that can be a fatal thing. So you have to be very cautious about that. But you can see the tonicity there and how much sodium three percent has. Now take this into consideration because it has happened where they mixed a solution in the pharmacy that was intended to be on half normal saline, and they used this and they gave it to a kid, and uh, that kid ended up, of course, with a uh, a major uh, uh, brain event and and died. So th they're, they're, they have some serious fluids out there. Uh, Vicki, you, can you tell me, can, you have to call, I'm assuming the pharmacy for any hypertonic saline or only the 7.5%? Not any. Any. So even the 3%, you have to call the pharmacy for that. Yeah, we don't stock it on, in the Pixis. Yeah, that makes sense. That, 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 could, be, that could be a real problem, no? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so moving on, oncotic pressure, as I said, is defined as the osmotic pressure exerted by colloids in solution. Okay, we already talked about it's not colloid oncotic pressure, it is oncotic pressure. But we use COP. I still use it. It's comfortable for me. It's what I'm used to. 
Um, this is exerted by proteins in the plasma and has a normal value of 26 to 28. Now, it's important to know that um, albumin uh, is, well, albumin is 50 to 60% of the colloid in your blood, but it exerts 75 to 80% of the oncotic pressure. And it's responsible largely for how water stays where we want it, where it belongs. So in regards to third spacing from a reduction in oncotic pressure, the plasma refill rate is reduced and fluid accumulates in the interstitial space. I will say this, and I put it on there um, using this exact phraseology, albumin is much maligned for seemingly no good reason. And I know there was the Cochrane study in survival and all of that, but I, I got to tell you, I, 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 I don't know very many truly good intensivists who still um, look to the Cochrane study as being uh, valid when it comes to the patients in the critical care unit um, that are hypoproteinemic or hypoalbuminemic. Um, capillary leak syndrome is not decreased plasma refill rate. These are two completely different phenomenon, and the capillary leak syndrome is an inflammatory process, usually necessitating plasma purification techniques like cytosorb or something like that. It's That's a big, big problem. Usually find it in gross sepsis um, and uh, difficult, very challenging to manage. Giving that patient albumin would be really a tragic mistake because it's all going to leak out. So let's take a look at how this all works. You have your pre-capillary area here, your post-capillary area here. Your blood is going this direction. At, this is the arterial end. The fluid exits the, uh, ex exits the capillary since capillary hydrostatic, the fluid exits the capillary since capillary hydrostatic pressure is about 35 and it's greater than the blood colloidal osmotic pressure of 25. So plasma water goes this way. It goes along, and as when it gets to the mid portion, there's no net movement because the capillary hydrostatic pressure is now 25, and the blood colloidal osmotic pressure is also 25. So there's the IUCOP again, osmotic pressure. Then as you get to the venous side of all of this, the fluid re-enters the capillary since the capillary hydrostatic pressure now is 18 and is less than the blood colloidal pressure or osmotic pressure, which is now 25. So the fluid, now any fluid that doesn't get brought up here ends up going up through the lymph system back to the heart. Okay? However, if you are grossly hypoalbuminemic, hypoproteinemic, your osmotic pressure, oncotic pressure is very low, you will lose more water out this way and you will reabsorb less this way. So what will happen is your interstitial fluid volume will increase and your intravascular fluid volume will decrease you will end up with a grossly fluid overloaded patient that is intravascularly hypovolemic and big difference between fluid overload and volemia. They, are, they can be independent of each other. And we're going to get a little bit into that as we move forward. So what does fluid overload look like and why should we avoid the term fluid overload? Well, we've seen this before. I've used this picture many, many, many times. You can see how puffy your eyelids are. You know, I've seen far worse than this, but this is, I think, a pretty good example. If you looked at our hands, you would see them all swollen and uh, depress them. It'd be like pitting. You'd have three, four plus pitting edema in the legs. Not uncommon to see this phenomenon. They get ascites. There's a lot going on. But when you see this phenomenon, looking at the patient on the outside, 
you will also see it on the inside. Now, at first glance, you look at this picture and you believe that heart is distended. The heart's full, but the heart's not full. The patient has a right atrial, has a right superior pulmonary vein, has a, a arterial cannula going back to the aorta and had a competent aortic valve. That's not what the problem is. This, what you're seeing here is all edema. And there's edema here in this tissue here. You could see it actually weeping. And that kind of edema is from basically, well, it's either capillary leak syndrome, which I doubt in this case, highly, highly unlikely, or it's from third spacing due to severe hypoalbuminemia. A lot of resuscitation, going on pump, coming off pump, going back on pump after they pour in a bunch of stuff. You're giving volume just to manage this patient. It's leaking out and it just becomes a roller coaster, just a just a, a spiral out of control with the patient continuing to fill up with volume. And we got to fix that. But the preferred term is hyper or hypovolemia. That refers to blood volume. The fact of the matter both of the patients I previously just showed you could actually be grossly hypovolemic. And I showed that to you in that previous illustration, that if here you have your arteriole and you here you have your capillary and then your venule here, and you have fluid going out this way, and it's, uh, let's just say a unit, I'll make a unit of 10, but only five of it comes back and the lymph system can only handle so much, and that's just a continuous cycle, you could see where you can start seeing chatter in your line. Well, why am I empty? Give, give, you know, start giving some more volume, and if you're not giving the right volume, you're giving crystalloid at that point, not albumin or blood, then this just accelerates this, and then you have 15 and only 2.5. 10, 15 coming out, 2.5 going in, and the patient just continues to swell. But they're intravascularly hypovolemic. They are, their tank is empty. Using the right word or phrase to describe a specific pathological process, patient diagnosis, and or status is important not only within the intensive care unit and with the team, but also when we communicate with our colleagues or other people outside. This is not just a question, however, of semantics, which some people think. Using the incorrect term can lead to a misunderstanding and even to incorrect therapeutic decisions. For example, it's not uncommon to see people saying, ex uh, examining the patient, hey, the patient is fluid overloaded or they're hypervolemic because they are edematous or both and proposing fluid restriction or diuretics or somebody else says, well, let's start the patient on some Lasix. And maybe they didn't communicate it with that person. They communicated it somewhere else. You get the wrong information and that vernacular can make a big difference. In some cases, just you have to give volume, but the right volume. But you have to be careful. Um, for each gram of albumin you give, if there's volume there to claim, uh, one gram of albumin returns 18 cc's of uh, plasma water. Okay? So if you give a patient 100 grams, it would be 100 times 18, you would get back 1,800 cc's. The patient's hard if you're not protected vis-a-vis -vis on ECMO, cardiopulmonary bypass, or you're on, um, uh, uh, um, what I say, ECMO, something, a CVVH, I'm sorry, CRRT, to protect the patient and be able to get that volume off as the plasma refill rate increases, you can easily tip them into heart failure and that becomes a bigger problem to deal with. Vicki, any thoughts on this? Um, I'm actually covering 
considerable amounts of this with my hemodynamics uh, coming this week, Thursday, I think. Oh, good. Good. So that will reinforce it. Mm -hmm. Did you did you hear did you hear anything that I may have, uh, you know, gotten right, wrong, uh, should have stressed that I didn't anything to add to that? No, of course not. I mean, I wouldn't say, of course, but thank you. You're too kind. Is that my birthday? <laughs> Is that my birthday present? It was my birthday yesterday, everybody, in case you didn't know. Okay, so let's get to this. This slide, I absolutely love this slide because I see this phenomenon happen all of the time. And it's so easy for me to see it in the operating room on bypass with a hard shell venous reservoir. But let me, let me show you this. LV is left ventricle, mean arterial pressure, mean systemic pressure, which is venous. This is a venous pressure. Venous return pressure, PVR, and then right atrial pressure and RV pressure. So reading the figure from, uh, from uh, Vincent in Critical Care, the relationship between unstressed and stressed blood volume and mean systemic volume, I'm sorry, mean, yes, systemic pressure and its independence from mean arterial pressure and right atrial pressure. The right atrial pressure is important because the driving pressure for venous return, which is PVR, which is your venous return pressure, is the pressure difference between the mean systemic pressure here and the right atrial pressure here. Thus, for the same blood volume, vasodilatation by increasing the unstressed volume that's here decreases both the mean systemic pressure and the venous return pressure, causing cardiac output to decrease both on the left and the right side. So basically the LV goes out and of course all of the arteries, the arterial tree, and that's what we're going to refer to as the vascular waterfall. Well, when the patient, patient is vasodilatated, especially in the venous capacity system, the unstressed volume expands tremendously and the stressed volume comes down. And so you see here your mean systemic pressure and your pre venous return pressure is much smaller in this state. But what hasn't changed is the patient's volume. The patient's total intravascular volume is exactly the same. All that's changed is the size of the reservoir, which in this case, the venous capacitance system to hold the volume. And it reduces the return of the venous blood back to the heart. I'm gonna show you a couple of more slides, but I see this in the operating room with my reservoir by level going down. The patient I can tell is vasodilated. They may have esmolol on. I don't know exactly what the, whatever mechanism, too much uh, uh, sevoflurane, whatever the mechanism is, and we correct that. It is not increasing the arterial tone that is making that volume come back up. That's a minuscule amount of volume compared to the venous capacitance system. This is the mechanism by which that happens to us in the operating room. Here's three good examples in terms of the right atrial pressure and the mean systemic filling pressure. This is a hypovolemic patient. This is a Euvolemic patient, this is a hypervolemic patient. And you can see that the uh, venous return, because of the increase in mean systemic pressure from the volume expansion, and this is only if the heart can handle it. 
You have a sick heart, a failed right heart. This goes out the window and we're dealing with a whole different set of, 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 of circumstances. This is with a normal heart, a heart that's working fine, especially the right side. And you can see how the venous return due to the hypovolemia significantly changes based on the volume status of the patient. This slide I probably love absolutely the best. This is your center point, your control, whatever you want to call it. Um, this midline that you see here is basically euvolemia. The patient is got normal blood volume. If you give norepinephrine without changing the volume, you can see that their mean systemic filling pressure increases. You give a beta adrenergic agent and your mean systemic filling pressure decrease, decreases. This will increase or decrease, as the case may be, your cardiac output. Now, we'll do our four slides for acid-based physiology, which is what Vicky told me to do to start with. This lecture would have been over with a long time ago. Acid-based uh, hemostatic disturbances are very common clinical problems. We all know that. Free hydrogen ions are present in body fluids in extremely low concentrations. How low, you say? Normal hydrogen concentration in extracellular fluid is roughly 40 nano equivalents per liter. That is one millionth of the milliequivalent per liter concentration of sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarb. So very small amounts. However, hydrogen ions uh, are also highly reactive and allows them to bind more strongly to negatively charged protons of molecules than can sodium or potassium. And because of this, maintenance of a stable hydrogen ion level is uh, essential for normal cellular function. The range of hydrogen ion concentration compatible with life is relatively small. So between 16 and 160 nanoequivalents is, represents a pH of between 7.8 and 6.8, right? The higher your hydrogen concentration, the lower your pH. The lower your hydrogen ion concentration, the higher your pH. Now, we're all very familiar with this formula, so I won't belabor it. However, you have hydrogen and bicarb, forms a salt, dissociates into uh, carbonic acid, a weak acid, dissociates into water and CO2, and this uh, it, reaction is reversible fully, so it can go either direction. And this is what is essential for us to be able to uh, live as we do in a normal uh, uh, non-acidotic or alkalotic environment with the pH, normal pH. So here we see here, nano, uh, uh, nanomoles per liter, uh, 16 gives you a pH of 7.8 and of 160 gives you 6.8. So primary acid-based disorders in the CVICU, and I would probably say also in the, uh, in the critical care unit, of course, which it says I put CVICU, but appropriate for the heart room. The disorder, metabolic acidosis, your pH is down, your hydrogen ion concentration is elevated, your primary disturbance is a decrease in bicarb, and your compensatory response will be a decrease in PCO2. So if you have a patient that, uh, just hypothetically, you have a friend who is diabetic and they develop uh, DKA and their uh, pH is down in the 7.18 you know, range, you're going to see them going <sighs> for, for, to get that CO2 driven down and get that pH to come back up. Metabolic alkalosis, pH is up, hydrogen ion concentration down, 
primary disturbance, elevated bicarb. Compensatory mechanism is elevated PCO2. Now you remember, you can do that in reverse. You can have a respiratory acidosis, which is the exact op. I'll show you what I mean by that in, the, in terms of the compensation. pH is down. Hydrodion concentration is up. PCO2 is elevated. And the bicarb is going to elevate as well. So in the, in the metabolic acidosis, or alkalosis rather, your PCO2 went up in order to make the uh, uh, pH come down. But in the case of respiratory, I'm sorry, respiratory acidosis, you have instead your pH is down, so your PCO2 you need to drive up. And then you have respiratory alkalosis, elevated pH, decreased hydrogen ion concentration, decreased PCO2, decreased bicarb. Now, on ECMO, this is, you know, really easy to fix, maybe even in the ICU. Um, but I would say that um, on ECMO or on cardiopulmonary bypass, the respiratory components of all of this are so easy for us to fix. If you're dealing with a patient with ha that has normal lungs, doesn't have ARDS, then you can do it with the ventilator quite easily if they're ventilated. Uh, most of us do it just naturally by breathing. But these, of course, become more challenging for either of the uh, units, whether it be the OR or the CVICU. So you can also have mixed acid-based disturbances, metabolic acidosis. Primary change is a decrease in bicarb. And the compensatory re response to that is to increase the PCO2 1.2 millimeters of mercury for each one milli equivalent fall per liter fall in bicarb. And when we were, uh, oh, I'll get to it here in a second, metabolic alkalosis, you can see that you have an increase in PCO2 by 0.07 for every milli equivalent rise in bicarb. In respiratory acidosis, which we saw a lot of, during COVID, there was a uh, concept, a thought that these patients were going to remain hypercapnic after they uh, recovered from their disease. So we allowed their bicarb levels to go up. And that's the renal, you know, mostly uh, through renal uh, effect. But it takes about, I would say, probably five to seven days and maybe even longer than that. Vicki, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in order for the, the uh, kidneys to compensate for chronic respiratory acidosis uh, to make that change. And that's down here, I guess, in the chronic respiratory acidosis here. Here. Any thoughts? No, three to five days sounds right. Three to five, three to five days is about right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Fully compensated. Okay, so that, but it still is not, it's not instantaneous. So you have to live, you know, you have to allow that PCO2 to remain elevated. When I was over at um, Memorial and the Med Center, we were leaving the suite down low and leaving the PCO2s 55, 60, as long as the pH was above 7.29. Um, we were leaving it there to try and get it to come up. I saw bicarbs as high as 42 Did we do that at in our, at, 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 in our places? No, not that I can recall. Okay. You also have to consider that electrolytes are affected in um, acid-based disorders. In metabolic acidosis, greater than 50% of the excess hydrogen ions get buffered intracellularly. And electrolyte neutrality has to be maintained, and that's done by moving potassium out of the cell into the extracellular fluid. So you will frequently see um, elevated potassiums when you have a metabolically acidotic patient. And you have to be aware of that because you slam somebody with bicarb, depending on how high the K was, K may not have actually been elevated. But even if it's not, 
that K is going to go back intercellular and you could end up with hypokalemic ectopy or something else happening. Um, so you need to keep track of that. Ionized calcium levels also increase because hydrogen ions compete for calcium binding sites. Okay. When excess amounts of acid accumulate in the blood or in the tissue, acidemia develops. Thus, acidemia refers to the state of abnormally high acidity, a pH of less than 7.35 in the body. Acidosis, on the other hand, refers to the physiologic process that led to the acidemia. And actually, that was... Uh, Michelle actually had that, I believe. No, was it Michelle that had that in her lecture? I can't remember. It was one of, it was somebody. But I remember that in one of the ECMO Might lectures. I think it was Michelle. Might have been Michelle. I do. Okay, so who's ready for final exam? Okay, this is going to be fun. Okay, again. Whoever gets the most questions right, and right now, Jeffrey, you're you're you have the first, you have one right because you got the full name. Okay, question one: Which of these patients has metabolic acidosis? Is it A? Is it B? Is it C? Or is it D? Type your answers. I'll give you. I'll give you like um, ten seconds. I'm gonna start a clock. You get ten seconds, and you've already used five. Vicky. You want me to just say it? Yes. I'd say D. John Ingram got it right. Tom Shivers got it right. Okay, we got to keep track of these guys. Which one did you say, Vicky? D. D, you are correct. No, Lori, it's not B. We also, not enough. No, there's plenty of information. Not true. I disagree with you, J-Cam, Jeffrey. Plenty of information. That was the whole point of this exercise, but really good work. Okay. All right. Question two, what is the diagnosis? Then you have to type it. And you get 15 seconds. Hey, John, John Ingram, I haven't talked to you in forever, man. How are you? It's good to see you. No, Jay Camp. Oh, no, I thought you said not enough information. No, you have enough. Okay. Vicky? Uh, respiratory alkalosis. What? Well, yes. That's, 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 that's part of it. Tom Shiver, Tom, is it ship? No, Tom Shives. Tom Shives, good job. So it's combined metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. Compensated respiratory alkalosis. Well, it's not compensated, so I'm only going to give, I'm going to have to be careful about this. It's not compensated. It just so happens this patient has been coding their bagatum, their metabolically acidotic, but their bagatum so much, they're respiratorily alkalotic. This is combined respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. It's not compensated, but I will give half credit. Okay. pH 7.40, 24, same patient. Based on the above, what is the estimated base excess or deficit of this patient? I'll give you 15 seconds. <laughs> Uh 
Okay, Vicky? Uh, B. B, okay, no. B, no. John Ingram, negative 16. John, you are the one who got that one right. Okay, so I don't want to give you the, I don't want to talk about the, why the answer is this until after we get through because there's bonus questions. Okay. You are on cardiopulmonary bypass or ECMO. You draw an ABG from your sampling port. The ABG reports as follows. 7.48, 86, 340, sodium 187, potassium 2.1. What is the most likely cause? And I'll give you 15 seconds. That's 10, five to go. This happened to me just the other day. Okay, Vicky, any idea? Yes, hi, there is a high bicarb, that's true. There was, that, well, there was, there, there in fact was, but I didn't put it on here. I just gave you this information. And there's a reason I only gave you this information. Anybody? Somebody gave, nope, Tom, nope, JCAM, no, somebody added bicarb to my sampling port. They gave the patient a unit of bicarb. And when I drew the lab out of it, it had some of the bicarb left behind. Too much diamox. Now, that's a good one, though. Could be, but no, this was a contaminated sample port. You get a crazy looking sample. What do you do? You draw another sample from somewhere else if you can or make sure you wash it real well. But that's what happened here. Okay, final exam, bonus question. And this is worth, so people can catch up. This is worth five points, okay? So it's worth a lot. PH 7.21, PCO2 22, PO2 44, base deficit is negative 23. Does this patient have severe metabolic acidosis, severe respiratory acidosis, severe metabolic acidosis and severe respiratory alkalosis and hypoxemia? Just hypoxemia, it's a bad sample or there's insufficient data. C, okay. C, C, wow, everybody's saying C. Vicky? Ah, E, bad sample, no. Vicky Carlisle? I'm sorry. I think your I think your uh I think your mic is off. Your mic is off. Your that's all right. Just text her. Okay, so there's insufficient data. And the reason I say that is we don't know anything about the patient. Is this patient in the ICU on a balloon pump and an impella? Is this patient on ECMO? And if they are, where did we draw the sample from? Is this an arterial blood gas or is it a venous blood gas? Um, so that's just to name a few. There's a whole host of things, just those, however, you would need to have that information to really know what the diagnosis for this patient is. They're certainly metabolically acidotic. They have this too. They have this, they have this. It's not a bad sample, but there's definitely the best answer would be insufficient data because you don't know what is the condition of this patient. What are they on ECMO? Did we draw this from the left side? Did we draw this from the right side? 
is this a Venus gas? What is it? So the numbers alone, you all assumed it was arterial because everything else has been, but it was a bonus question, so it was a trick. So it looks like everybody believed it was C, which I think is the second next best answer. Good question. We assume it's arterial. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to give everyone that said C half credit at least. I think that's fair. So two and a half points to everyone that picked C because that would be the next most reasonable answer. Okay. With that said, we're going to get, oh, Vicky, your microphone is, you're, you're muted. Oh, she's back. Which one did you guess, Vicky? Oh, I need to go back. You bet C. Okay. You get two and a half points. So let me go back to this for a second if I can. If you look at this blood gas, and this is not exact, but it's really doggone close. A normal PCO2 is 40, okay? A normal pH for total 100% neutrality is 7.4, okay? If your PCO2 is 45, your pH is going to be 7.35. You have total, your zero, your, your base is zero. Your bicarb is normal. So purely just looking at it from a respiratory component. If your pH is 7.5, your PCO2 is going to be 30. So it's just respiratory alkalosis. Your bicarb is 24. Your base is zero. So if you take two numbers, 757 and 23, you take 40, and you subtract 23, you get 17. If you take 7.57 and you subtract 17, so it goes in the after the decimal point, you get 7.40. So 7.5723 is 7.40. And 40, it's the same number. It's not, because that's not what the measurement is. But I know immediately that that patient does not have metabolic acidosis. Now, it, the answer was D. So if I have a PCO2 of 30 and I need it to be 40, I minus, I, I need 10, okay? So 10, if I had a PCO2, the pH at 30 should be, and let me erase some of this. Clear pen markings, there we go. So at 7.40, because it went up, this has to come down to 25. If I take 40 minus 25, it's 15. The 7.40 becomes 7.25. This patient is respiratory alkal respiratorily alkalotic slightly, but they are metabolically acidotic. That formula goes through this entire program. A pH of 7.4 and a PCO2 of 24 is like saying... Seven point two four forty. That's what it's like. That's what it's saying. Now it's not precise, not exact, but it's awfully doggone close. So two numbers will tell you whether it's only respiratory or alkalotic, and then all the rest of this you can figure it out from there. And that's where I got the minus sixteen for this question here, and then that one was uh, this one here was the uh, contaminated uh, sampling port. And the other thing too, you see a gas like this, what's the first thing you should do? First thing besides, uh-oh, what's this? First thing you should do, look at the patient. 
look at the monitor. This patient looks perfectly fine. Why does it look like this? This doesn't, this, this does not represent this. How many pressors are on? Not really that much. Something is, some, something's definitely wrong. And then uh, over here, basically it was the issue of, we don't know where the gas was drawn. Is it arterial? Is it venous? Which made it that. But in reality, um, I don't even, yes, it definitely, I think that C was the next best answer. And I made it close on purpose. Okay. All right. That was fun, I think. Um, uh, Magic, are you able to add up those points? Are you going to be able to add up those points? They're in the thing right here in the top chat. Do we, can we say, do we save the top chat? Okay, very good. Here, let me turn this so it's straight. Okay. All right. Yeah. It needs to be turned a little more. Okay. There you go. It's a mega hat for anybody that hasn't, doesn't see it. Uh, Vicky, would you like one? No, no, you don't want one? Okay, so anyway, I'm do you have any good. thoughts? Mm -hmm. Say again. I'm good. You're good? Okay, all right. It's a stylish hat. It's a nice red color. Mm -hmm. It's really pretty. So anyway, you have any thoughts on that portion of the lecture? Vicki, do you have any thoughts on that portion of the lecture? No. No? You're good? Okay, very I'm, good. I'm used to having all of the ABG information. Say that again? What'd you say? I like having all of the ABG numbers. Well, of course you do, but, you know, it's not, it's not the exercise, right? Okay, let's just press on and get through this right now. Effects of pH management during deep hypothermic bypass on cerebral microcirculation, alpha stat versus pH stat. Now, as a matter of fact, John Ingram gave a lecture on this some years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was, it was excellent. And I went back and actually reviewed that, John. So disclaimer, I do not do pediatric cases. And I understand, and we'll discuss this a little bit about, this tends to be or seems to be a controversy within that realm of pediatric perfusion. However, I do occasionally have profound hypothermia cases, and I really wanted to understand this better and what we're doing, and there is data out there for adults, so I think this is uh, worth discussing. So over here on the left side of the screen, is pH stat on the right side of the screen is alpha stat. So at 37 degrees, the pH would be 7.26 and the PaCO2 would be 56, but measured at, we're going to say in this case, 28 degrees, it would be 7.4 and a PCO2 of 40. And if you go back to what I said earlier, if you take 16, it would end up being, it looks like it would be 42. So I told you it wasn't exact, but pretty close. 726, 456, 7440. That shows you there how that formula can work. Um, and then on the right side, alpha stat, you're correcting the gases to 37. So they measure 7.56 and 26, but they are reported to you as 7.4. PaCO2 of 40. So carbon dioxide is a potent cerebral vasodilator, also a controversial subject or point. Therefore, the increase in carbon dioxide content during pH management uncouples cerebral autoregulation, um, cerebral blood flow increases independent of cerebral metabolic demand that may cause intracranial hypertension from this luxurious flow and uh, perhaps some congestion 
Not sure if that how real that is, but um, an increase in microembolism potentially. Again, I don't see that at all, but it's one of the things that is published. Um, and this came out of Miller's anesthesia. Carbon dioxide causes systemic vasodilatation as well, resulting in faster, more hom homogeneous cooling of the patient. I thought that was interesting, right? Um, pH stat counteracts the leftward shift of the high he oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve that occurs with hypothermia and hypothermia-induced alkalemia increases offloading of hemoglobin to the tissues and may increase oxygen delivery, which may optimize myocardial function, but may also optimize, I'm assuming, oxygenation of the brain. That didn't get listed, but that's what I would think. A lower PAO, PACO2 is targeted than for the pH stat approach. That's when I say lower, measured lower, not not reported lowered. The alpha stat approach targeting uh, allows cellular transmembrane pH gradients, intracellular trapping of meta metabolic intermediates and protein function maintenance, maintains cerebral autoregulation and avoids the potential problem of excess cerebral blood flow, such as intracranial hypertension and increased microembolization. Uh, the alkaline pH improves cerebral protection during the ischemic insult, and the disadvantage of alpha-stat include less efficient and less homogeneous cooling and less reduction of oxygen consumption. So, you know, that's a really, these are some really interesting things. If I do it this way, I can cool the patient more completely and faster. I can unload the oxygen to the patient more easily. I can uh, get more blood flow to the brain, which may or may not be beneficial, but maybe we, we don't really, I, I don't, I don't put a lot of stock in this idea. As long as you have, you have outflow, you don't have outflow obstruction. I don't believe you should really develop that uh, uh, intracranial hypertension, but regardless, that's what I can do there. But over here, being more alkalotic helps to uh, protect the tissue from the ischemic, the brain, especially from the ischemic insult. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it reduces this risk of uh, hypertension, cerebral hypertension. Um, it uh, maintains protein function and uh, the metabolic intermediates. So I see some advantages. Now it offloads oxygen less efficiently which may or may not be good or bad, I guess, depends on how far it shifts and how much affinity there is. And I got to say, I'm not really sure, you know, which one of these is the better choice. They each seem to have an advantage and each seem to have enough disadvantages to give me pause one way or the other as to which way I would like to go. And maybe we should be doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that or doing it one way less I'm not exactly sure, but it's something that I, uh, I will ponder over the next several weeks uh, to come to some conclusions. We're all familiar with the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, so I won't get too uh, in the weeds with it. Left shift, increased affinity for oxygen to hemoglobin, so less unloading, um, and uh, of course, uh, de increase pH, decrease PO2, all of these things, decrease PCO2, hydrogen ion concentration to the right. It's the exact opposite. And then, of course, you have your normal. And you see this graph here. This graph basically is represented by these numbers that you see right here. And so at 37 degrees, a pH of 7.40 is a, has a PCO2 of 40 and a PO2 of 80. When you have a fever, 39 degrees, you're 737, same gas, right? Same kind of, well, just what the temperature does to it, 4491. And then at 20 degrees, you're 7.65, 19, and 27. So you could see by this that if I go uh, over here and put a mark at 19 in this area, and here it is at 40, and I have my blood CO2 content. The content 
at this 19 has not changed. The content is still the same. The partial pressure of the gas that's being measured. Content hasn't changed. So you could see how much more CO2, how much more content there would be if you were to increase how, or how much higher you have to take your O2 content in order to get your PCO2 back over here. It's quite a bit. There is still considerable controversy, as the authors say, regarding the optimal acid-base management strategy during hypothermic cardiopulmonary bypass. Now, I do believe in the pediatric world, they pretty much all use pH stat. During cooling, the decreased kinetic energy associated with the lower temperature decreases the dissociation of all weak acids and bases in biologic solutions. Thus, hypothermia results in a natural alkaline shift of blood pH. Two alternative strategies have been developed in response to the natural alkaline shift. The term alpha stat indicates pH management uh, media pH management strategy in which blood CO2 is allowed to follow its thermodynamically mediated dissociation change with hypothermia, which we just saw what that did. The alternate method, they discuss it, and they say in here uh, as well that you will have to use 3 or 5% CO2. So when I first started in this industry back in 1977, when we did cases that gas tank that I used, the big E-cylinder, was a 95.5 tank because all of our patients, we cooled way down and uh, we used, unbeknownst to us, we didn't understand that that's what it was, but, or the difference pH stat and alpha stat, we didn't call it that. We cooled everybody and we ran our blood gases at, uh, were reported at the temperature corrected to the temperature. So we needed to use 95.5 on all of our cases. In the 1960s and 70s, the pH stat strategy was used widely, not where I was at. In the 1980s, many institutions shifted towards the alpha stat strategy for pH management, complete opposite of how I was trained, and mainly because of studies of cold-blooded vertebrates. I tried to look that up. I really don't know what the hell that's about. If anybody does, please feel free to call in or type it in, whichever it is. One continuing reason for the popularity of Albastat in clinical practice is because no addition of carbon dioxide is required. Now we just use a blender, O2, room air, and we, we, we blend our, our FiO2 and you sweep. We don't have to add CO2 to the gases anymore. But maybe we should be. Again, I'm not sure which is the best, um, but it, this is a very provocative, I think uh, this article that I, I showed you, that I'm showing you is very provocative and I think something really worth watching or uh, looking at. So here are some gases. Uh, this was done on pigs. And if I remember correctly, I know it was an animal model, but they looked to see um, what was going on with the patient's uh, brains afterwards, and uh, in the alpha stat group and the pH stat group. So pre bypass, they were seven four six and four seven four nine. Ten minutes on uh, normal thermic bypass, seven five two and seven four one. At the end of cooling, seven point seven and seven point three nine. So the alpha stat, of course, was uh, much more alkalotic. Uh, 10 minutes of rewarming, you see the difference, end of rewarming, and so forth. And then you can look at the PCO2s, 36 and 38, and by the end, 13 and 44. Um, and then the arterial PO2, uh, you know, that doesn't really make much of a change. The crits and all of that, I'm not going to get into, but you can see the mean arterial pressures there. And in terms of tissue oxygenation, and they use this autofluorescence, NADH autofluorescence, which is some method by which they can view um, oxygenation in tissue. And they looked at the parietal cortex and it decreased 93.2% in the alpha stat versus 94.3 in the pH stat during normal thermic bypass relative to baseline, indicating better cerebral oxygenation in both groups. 
during cooling, the tissue oxygenation declined below baseline levels in the alpha stack group. At the end of cooling, the fluorescence reached 98.2% and 103.3% in the pH and alpha stat groups respectful, respectively, um, though that was not statistically significant, however, indicating significantly poor tissue oxygenation in the alpha stat group. So that's the group that does not measure at the temperature. You're correcting the 37 degrees. So you are uh, you have uh, respiratory alkalosis. During deep hypothermic circulatory rest, there was a tendency for more severe deoxygenation in the alpha stat group, could be because of uh, cerebral vascular vasoconstriction. In the early warming phase, the tissue oxygenation was significantly higher with the pH stat strategy. Furthermore, the recovery time to reach baseline values again was much shorter in the pH stat group versus it, which was 10 minutes versus 35 minutes in the uh, alpha stack group. However, by the end of reperfusion after weaning from bypass, the metabolic recovery was complete in both groups. And they conclude that there were no significant differences between the groups at final recovery. There was also no statistical differences between the groups with respect to systemic lactate levels during cooling. However, during early reperfusion, the whole body lactate levels were significantly higher in the alpha stat group. Okay, so again, that could be because of vasoconstriction with that very low PCO2 or vasodilatation because of the higher CO2 or lower pH and ion concentration, because that's yet another very controversial topic. Is it CO2 directly, or is it hydrogen ion concentration? And I've got something in here, and you can look and you can find something to support both sides of this argument, which makes it great for us. Also, and I thought this was very important because we are always very concerned about leukocyte adhesion. The number of adherent leukocytes to cerebral venules was was uh, the numbers here in the alpha stat and pH group respectively, which essentially was no difference. Okay, so at the end of the day, um, there really was no difference. There didn't. There was no long term issues. Nothing really went wrong. There were some subtle hints that things may have been less well perfused, but. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't know the clinical significance, but I don't think there was any harm from the luxurious cerebral perfusion that was accomplished by virtue of having the um, the uh, uh, either the lower pH or the elevated CO2, whichever the case is. Cerebral tissue oxygenation was significantly higher in the pH stat group at the end of cooling and during early reperfusion after DHCA. Uh, this finding might be related to the effect of CO2 in counteracting this leftward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation group, which we talked about. The rightward shift with the pH strategy should increase oxygen availability for the tissues. The finding of a higher lactate level with the alpha state strategy supports the, con the concept that there is improved oxygen availability with the pH stat strategy, meaning it's giving it off to the tissue much more easily. This is consistent with a previous study from this same lab where they compared hyperoxic and normooxic uh, management and found an improved histological outcome with the hyperoxia. Uh, well, we don't need to get into the weeds on that. Um, Okay, um, other studies have demonstrated the rate of depletion of brain oxygen during uh, DHCA is significantly lower with the pH stat strategy in comparison to alpha stat. As a possible explanation, it has been argued that the more acidotic intracellular pH causes a depression of metabolism that should further decrease the oxygen consumption during deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. So you have a reduction in metabolic demand as well as oxygen more willing to go off into the tissue. We found that cerebral oxygen tissue was lower at all times during circa rest 
with alpha stat relative to BA stat. However, in our intra vital microscopic study, the rate of depletion of brain oxygen was not significantly different between the two groups. Again, not real strong conclusiveness here. Using intra vital uh, fluorescence, what I talked about earlier, microscopy, we were able to directly visualize and measure the microcirculatory effects of pH management during DHCA on the brain. The pH strategy resulted in greater tissue oxygenation at the end of cooling, at the end of beginning of reperfusion after DHCA. This adds further evidence to support the use of pH strategy for deep hypothermal uh, bypass with and without circ arrest. We conclude that the pH strategy is preferable in patients undergoing uh, DHCA to improve cerebral uh, tissue oxygenation. And I can't say that I would disagree with that conclusion, even though there wasn't a huge difference. I didn't see anywhere where they were doing harm. And there was some certainly suggestion that there was better overall tissue oxygenation and perfusion using um, the, uh, the uh, uh, pH stat uh, strategy. Now, I really like this one. This one I thought was also very, very interesting. Um, and uh, this in this, these studies, these are not for DHCA. This is for moderate cooling, really. A best evidence topic in cardiac surgery was written according to a structured protocol, what they did. The question addressed was whether pH stat or alpha stat is the best technique to follow in patients undergoing DHCA. Altogether, 206 papers were found using the reported search of which 16 represent the best evidence to answer the clinical question. I thought this was a great, this was a great uh, uh, article. The authors, journal date and country of publication, patient group studies, study type, relevant outcomes and results of these papers are tabulated. Now, in the interest of your sanity and mine, I'm not going to go through all of these. And I only put a select few up here versus us going through all 16 because we would have no one subscribe to our channel. So in this particular case, um, we find that there is a level 1B uh, in terms of evidence and, uh, and uh, its uh, uh, recommendation. It was done in 2009. They looked at 40 patients. They were greater than 70 years old. They were cooled, be there were cabbages. They were cooled to 28 to 32. Um, they, it is a randomized study. So again, the level of evidence is good. It's one. Um, and, uh, and that's good. But again, I'm not going to go through all of the, re the details. We're going to get kind of to where, where it all ends. In this particular study from 2003, uh, it is also a prospective randomized study, 1B. You have 52 patients. They were cabbages, either alpha or pH stat blood gas management. They went to 27 degrees. They looked at uh, jugular uh, venous O2 saturations and cerebral arterial venous oxygen glucose uh, use. In this study out of the UK, uh, was done in 96. It's prospective randomized. It's also double-blinded and uh, 1B. These are 70-year-olds because this is my practice, right? I don't do peds. I told you that. I do this. Should I be at somebody up cooling to 28 degrees for a valve maze cabbage? Um, should I be doing pH stat or should I be doing alpha stat, which I've been doing forever? Um, they cooled to 28. Patients were randomly allocated you know, blah, 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 cerebral blood flow. They use cerebral oxygen metabolism were recorded before, during, after bypass. Uh, they also did neuropsychologic tests uh, later on to compare the two groups in this particular study. This one here, um, also out of the UK, 1995, randomized perspective, double blind, 70 patients, um, and uh, let's see where the temperature 28 degrees right there. They looked at cerebral blood flow, cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen and postoperative cognitive dysfunction. And here's another study again, 100 patients, cabbages under 30 degrees. Um, same kind of thing. They even looked at renal function studies in this particular one. And you can find all of these uh, in the original 
that I showed you with the title of this, of this article. It was very good. So let's get to this part, because this is the part that's good. Um, we already discussed the introduction. The clinical scenario is you are, a, according to this, is the author's writing this, of course, um, you are in the operating theater with a repair of a congenital heart lesion. You note the anesthesiologist used pH stat to manage blood gases. I guess I could change that and say you notice that uh, the, uh, I'll just say the perfusion, some perfusionist is doing it, and you're going to be relieved. And you recalled from your placement from when you did your adult uh, perfusion uh, rotation that Alva strategy, stat strategy was consistently used instead. You ask the other perfusionist why, and he admits that it is a controversial topic and suggests that you look it up for the evidence yourself. That would be, I would say that was probably about how somebody would respond. That's how I would respond to it probably. Um, because I don't, I think it, well, let me get through this. You'll understand. Um, Three-part question. For patients undergoing cardiac surgery with DHCA, is pH or alpha stat the best technique in terms of morbidity and mortality? Uh, med uh, they searched Medline from 1950 to 2009 doing this for these things. The search outcome gave them this many papers, and here are the results. And it goes from here, and then I have them typed out after this part that I copied, and I will just read them. Whether pH or alpha stat strategy is the ideal acid-based management during severe uh, hypothermic circulatory arrest, I wouldn't say severe, I would say deep or profound, severe sounds like it's bad. So, well, but that's what they say. Arrest has been the subject of contention. Proponents of pH stat management, whereby adding CO2 to the oxygenator counteracts the increased solubility of CO2 at lower temperatures to keep the normothermic pH the same state that the higher, the same state that the higher CO2 causes cerebral vasodilatation and faster and more homogeneous cooling. It is also proposed that this counteracts the hypothermic leftward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, reserve, re resulting in better oxygenation. Proponents of alpha stat management, excuse me, proponents of alpha stat management, whereby there is alkaline drift during hypothermia, state that this allows cerebral autoregulation to continue and that cellular transmembrane pH gradients and protein function is maintained, much like that article that we looked at a minute ago. In addition, they state that the alkaline pH improves cerebral protection during the ischemic insult. Now, if you have retrograde cerebral perfusion or antigrade, though I prefer retrograde, you really shouldn't have an ischemic insult. But, you know, I guess we probably do have something. Uh, Piccioni gave inconclusive results. They found no significant difference between the two groups with regard to tissue perfusion as demonstrated by the similar tissue oxygenation par parameters and lactate concentrations. However, they found that after CPB, the acidosis caused by this procedure was less significant in patients managed by alpha stat strategy than the pH stat strategy. The remaining 15 papers demonstrated either a preference of one method of acid-based management during deep hypothermic circuit arrest or no significant difference between the two study groups. Hoover and Sakamoto at on Heki at on all these people, the other studies demonstrated a significant benefit in favor of pH stat as the choice of acid-based management. Hoover suggested that adults with high risk of impaired cerebral blood flow, remember these are on adult, age 70, uh, or old, diabetic, prior stroke, uncontrolled hypertension, pH stat group have higher oxygen tension and saturation during CPB. The latter three studies were all related to pediatric cardiac surgery. Furthermore, uh, Sakamoto demonstrated that pediatric patients with cyanotic anomalies in the pH stat group have decreased pulmonary collateral circulation and lower lactate levels. Both Hickey and Plessis suggest that pediatric patients managed with pH stat had better neurologic outcomes and shorter recovery times, uh, I'm sorry, shorter time to first EEG reading. Recovery time to first EEG reading. The clinical bottom line, what y'all been waiting for, excluding one paper which provided inconclusive results, six studies found better 
cerebrovascular metabolism with alphastat, while three studies found better cerebrovascular metabolism with pH stat. Four other studies showed no significant difference in the cerebrovascular metabolism between the two acid-based management strategies in patients undergoing DHCA. Nine studies compared the neuropsychological outcome in patients who underwent DHCA arrest with three studies supporting each alternate conclusion of preference towards alpha-stat or pH-stat management. The remaining three studies showed no statistical or no significant, I'm sorry, difference between the two groups of acid-base management. Comparing the 16 studies based on the age of the patient's studies, three out of the four papers which demonstrated that the pH-stat method is a better strategy to improve intraoperative and postoperative outcomes were based on a sample of pediatric patients. Conversely, all seven papers that suggested alpha-stat method is associated with better intraoperative and postoperative outcome were based on studies done on adult patients. Makes sense, right? The remaining four papers suggested no difference or no significant difference between the pH-stat group and the alpha-stat group. In conclusion, there is evidence to suggest that the best technique to follow in the management of acid-based patients undergoing DHCA during cardiac surgery is dependent upon the age of the patient with better results using pH stat in pediatric patients and alpha stat in adult patients. So that's their conclusion. With all of that said, Perfwood welcomes you back to 2024. I will open the floor to any questions anyone might have. And Vicki, I'm going to pick on you first and see if you have anything you would like to uh, challenge me on today. Well, I don't know much about the alpha stack. I mm -hmm. don't do perfusion. So it's all just learning for me. Well, you know, we do therapeutic hypothermia. Okay, so in therapeutic hypothermia, where we go to 35 degrees, should we be measuring our blood gases at 35 degrees or at 37 degrees? Because at 30, if you measure them at 37, you are your your actual CO2 content is decreased, right? You're actually alkalotic. Thomas DeSalvio, come sit down. It's interesting. You got here just in time for us to go get lunch, dinner. How are you? It's good to see you. What's going on? You get one. Come on. Can you spread it out a little bit? There you go. I'm done. So you have any questions? Did you listen? Well, tell me what you think. Vicky is Vicky is not in the mood to challenge me. She wants. She's like, I'm not saying anything else. Anybody online? Excellent masterclass. Thank you, Gilberto. You win a prize just for that. <laughs> Anybody that says something nice to me, I appreciate that. So since you listened to it, any thoughts, comments, suggestions? The big, yeah, yeah, the biggest thought is we don't have the luxury of um, analyzing these samples from the inlets and outlet ports on the brain during the hypothermic um, integrated or retrograde cerebral perfusion. So, um, we always just, and the other big thing was we had CDI monitoring and most of our people would actually shut it off because it was part of the arterial filter. Mm -hmm. And when you go on circuit rest, you would turn it off. And so that muted all of your information that you could get, or you could push the button from alpha stat to pH stat, which was really ah, cool. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would do that. I would leave it on mm -hmm. and um, watch the numbers and switch it back occasionally because people, there's just, you know, everybody wants to try to fight this one out. But I think ultimately... You, what we get when we draw a sample, it's a global, full body sample that's like a, an average of everything that's going on everywhere. And I'm not sure that our patients still woke up and yeah. they, did, they, they, they look like they were doing fine. And other things, um, when you do circuit rest, there are physiological things that happen to the pump. So as, as you get colder and colder and colder, the first thing that happens is all of your volume goes away. 
Yeah, yeah. they vasodilate. And then the second thing is mm -hmm. your flows go down. Yeah, because so, you don't have any return. Yeah. And those two things kind of limit the amount of blood that's going to the brain ar already. And then when we flow anagrade or even retrograde cerebral perfusion, we're only flowing, you know, sometimes 400 cc's a minute or up to a liter a minute. And in terms of, you know, hurting the brain because you're f overflowing, I'm not sure that a liter a, a minute would do that. I don't think so either. I think that it would have to be a, ma a, a massive amount, I, especially since we're really not flow. If you lose the autoregulation, it's flow dependent. If you're on DHCA, now while you're cooling, you lose the autoregulation. Mm -hmm. That's different because it just opens up and the blood preferentially goes to the path of least resistance. But, uh, I, I, you know, let me, let me make this, read this right. comment. John Ingram says, in cold-blooded animals, these animals physiologically stay with the alpha stat blood gas levels, which caused us to lean in towards uh, staying with alpha stat in the early days. Being warm-blooded animals ourselves caused research to look into the ideal physiologic blood gases uh, that would be best managed, how they should be best managed, and the things you pointed out, better superfusion, et cetera, uh, that causes many who cool at least below mm. Oh, Oops. shoot. Well, that didn't work out too well. Uh, below, I can't read that, that temperature because you have a heart in the way. So, can you read that? 30. 30 degrees uh, to shift the pH stat below that temperature. Got it. Yes. I agree. I agree. I think, uh, I think, that's, I think those are all truisms, uh, John. So, you know, we, we you know, I, I run mine. I measure it, I correct it to 37 degrees. That's what I do. But I wonder if it wouldn't make sense for the better cooling, the more even cooling, because I, I really don't agree with this idea that you're gonna get more microemboli because you have more flow. And it doesn't look like anybody really had a negative effect of this increase or loss of autoregulation <clears throat> that to do that, and sort of do a hybrid between the two for different reasons, you know, but the increased offloading, uh, you know, the, the, the shift on the hemoglo uh, hemoglobin associated curve to the um, uh, left, to the right, decreasing yeah. the affinity uh, makes sense to me that you're getting the tissue, the but then you also have to remember what's, what's that, that gonna do to the oxygen, your saturation but I mean, it's so high. Yeah, you know, I don't think that's really gonna. That that was the other thing I was thinking about was the, the saturation levels. We, so one of our surgeons had this protocol where whenever we were gonna do go on circ arrest, something like two minutes before we go on circ arrest, we were supposed to set the FiO2 at a hundred percent. And the theory on that was that it would hyper oxygenate not just the hemoglobin but the whole cell, and then it would push nitrogen out, so that while we were on circ arrest, there wouldn't be any nitrogen to form bubbles mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. You know, most people run their, run their PO2s pretty high anyway. Yeah, and, I do. Yeah. And, you know, and also during these, these, these cold temperatures, when you're cooling the blood, you have to remember to turn down your sweep and turn down your FiO2 accordingly, if you're following what the CDI says, because it will give you, you know, really big numbers. Yes. If, you're, if you're trying to keep what, what the ABCP says should be normal, um, mm -hmm. American board says should be normal, um, you're going to be turning your FO2 down, you're going to be turning your sweep down, and then when you actually give um, cerebral perfusion, you're going to be flowing with your FO2 at like 30%, mm -hmm. if not, if mm -hmm. not off, mm -hmm. which is kind of mm -hmm. weird because you can only see that if you have your CDI on. Well, you know, I mean, this concern about oxygen, um, hey, Joe, I think the concern of possible increased microemboli I went back to the days of bubble. I don't believe I agree with you there. Mm. That's probably very true. That's probably, but again, I don't think that loss of autoregulation and that increased flow, if we're pumping, we were pumping bubbles at everybody, you know, so I, I don't, I don't think the, I don't think the, the, the nominal increase what's your what you're saying more yeah. problems what's your favorite saying no bubbles no troubles but that one too but also what's yeah, a no little bubbles no troubles but what's a little air among friends little air among that's friends. very true so uh opft leans towards hyperoxemia during cooling for circ arrest yep 
Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people do that. Um, I, that's what you just yeah. got through saying. And the other big thing I think is that it addressing the, the PO twos when you're that cold, or it's not as important as addressing the CO twos when you're that cold, because they, they're, they're wildly different when you, when you have the ability to push the button on the machine and switch from alpha to pH, they're wildly different. Yeah. yeah I did. Well, you didn't see my diagram. I have a yeah. diagram to show you how different they are. Yeah. Um, and I've I sat there and go, well, if I treat this, I think I can find it. It was pretty easy to find. There it is right there. So at 37 degrees, a pH of 7.4, PCO2 of 40, and a, a PO2 of 80. At mm -hmm. 20 degrees, not changing anything, is 7.6519. Well, what I would look at is at the same temperature, pushing the button. So you would see, you would see exactly how it changed. No, that's, that's what this is. Oh, it's 20 and 20? If you were to take, okay. if you were to take this blood gas that you were at got 20 it. degrees. I got it. I got it. Yeah. And if you took this blood gas and corrected, corrected it to 37, it. Right. that's what that's you what would you get. get. Yeah. I mean, that's a massive difference. That's a pretty alkalotic yeah. pH, 7.65. Right. But, but, it's, but it's protective of tissue. The, al the alkalemia is protective to the tissue. Well, sometimes you got to wonder, isn't that the purpose of the, the um, deep hypothermia? Yes, but, you know, you, you know we, I don't necessarily think deep hypothermia is good for anybody. Mm -hmm. But regardless... <laughs> I feel like my patients do well. Um, you know, Vicky, you've you've probably uh, recovered a few DHCA patients that I've done, and they've they've done pretty well. They don't remember me, but they remember everything else. It seems um, you've done a lot of them. I think in adults, it's a different paradigm. I think kids is very different. I don't have enough knowledge to really get into the weeds on that and what those differences are. But I think in adults. 28 degrees, maybe we should run our PCO2s if we're going to correct 37. Um, instead of 40 or 35 or 36, maybe we should run them 45 or 50. Maybe that's a better place to be. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I really got to think about this. But it was a provocative, right. uh, so uh, I, controversial I've, talk. Yeah, I've always said, well, ever since I learned about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, that we don't follow it. We don't use it. Um, the only reason that we exist is so that you can take a test. Yes. And it, I always said, well, if you're not going to follow and you're not going to use it, then why even, why is it, why is it there? Because the truth is higher CO2s should be the norm. And uh, the norms, it's only on bypass. But yeah, you have to make that but caveat. True. But in adults, and, and I understand on bypass right. does make a big difference, but in adults, hypercapnia can cause pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. I, I would say that. Those on bypass, are, it yeah, won't. They're very. Li we're, we're we're on bypass for a short period of time, and that's why the rules need to change for bypass because we are no longer a beating heart. We're now usually linear flow. Um, we are. We've changed things. We're in an artificial situation where you've got tubing that's plastic that blood is going through, and there's all kinds of edema that's kind of, that's being fired. All kinds of all kinds of stuff that's being activated, and and it, the blood the body doesn't like that. So we need to. Change the standards to 48 to 52 on your CO2 at, when you're on bypass. And you know, you, that, the, the longer, the short-term hit that the body takes is not as significant as the short-term hit that the brain takes when you run normal CO2s. And also, a lot of anesthesiologists prefer that we run our pHs at like 7.32 or 7.33. Sure, because you're gonna have you're gonna you're gonna again you're offloading oxygen more well, easily. What you're gonna get is a normal base excess, and they're treating a number, and they're not treating. I mean that doesn't make any sense. Okay, but you're yeah. right, it's treating a number, right? That doesn't make it doesn't make sense to do that in my right. opinion. Right. I don't I don't ascribe to that theory. So because I've, I've actually had several anesthesiologists say, hey, why don't you you know blow your CO two off so that we can get the get a prettier, you know, get a base excess correction. But so, yeah, but that's not base excess is based on, oh, well, base, base mm -hmm. excess, base deficit is more PCO2. Uh, yeah. Or I mean, not PCO2 is, is more, right, is more metabolic right. component, not respiratory. So I don't understand that thought. Doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Just something to throw out there. Fair enough. Vicki, any, any last comments? Are you watching ECMO tonight? No? Yes. You're yes. not watching ECMO tonight? 
Yes, you are. I yeah, am. You said, said I no, because if you're not, if you're not, I am. <laughs> okay, well, go get some sleep. Thank you for joining. I appreciate it. It was nice to see you. You made me feel not completely alone. I owe you for this one. Thank well, you. I'll be doing the balloon pump tomorrow, I believe. Yes. I uh, should be very good. And then uh, human, dy uh, human dynamic disturbances, I think, yes. is Thursday. I'm glad you brought uh, that up. Be as a matter very, of fact. very good lectures. Very good lectures. Tomorrow is IABP basics, and it's going to be very good mm -hmm. for yeah. perfusion. It's yeah. going to be an excellent lecture. Uh, then we're going to be like talking about treating hemodynamic disturbances. Uh, Thomas is going to be, this is on Thursday. The pressure is on, mm -hmm. weaning from bypass. That's going to be excellent. And then uh, Vicky on Friday, hemodynamic waveform analysis. All of these things I think are critically important for perfusionists and uh, critical care nurses, ECMO specialists to be to be uh, paying attention Absolutely. to. Yeah. You know, I was going to tell you one more thing. Go ahead. Today I was looking up some... Um, Alpha stat versus pH stat controversies. And I watched this guy's video and he never left normal thermic talk, but he talked about from internal organs, the pH, what the pH is and the CO2 is to muscles, to the skin. And even just at the same normal thermic temperatures, the variances are really evident. Oh, incredible. Yeah. Look at the kidney, what the PO2 is, <laughs> you know, from where it goes in to, where, to when you get into the into the cortex, it's like 25. You know, it's really low. It's it they it extracts a lot of oxygen because it's using a lot of it works hard. Um, last comments, um, John. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jeff Campbell. I run Alpha Stat, but we'll run PCO2 50 to 55 during cooling mm -hmm. for DHCA, then blow it off to a normal CO2 prior to arrest, got it. Uh, Pancho Villa, high CO2 activates chemo, chemo, chemo receptors and vasodilate uh, carotid arteries. And John, perfusionists who run uh, NEARS on the, the cerebral oximetry on bypass cases will invariably increasingly run higher CO2 levels because it is often a direct effect on increasing yes. the NEARS. Exactly. I agree with that 100%. The question is, and this will be the debate, is it the PCO2 or is it the hydrogen ions? And I forgot that I left that out of this lecture, but we're going to end early. I'm going to take you to dinner. I know you had a shitty day. I'm going to let Vicky go to sleep. <coughs> we're going to revisit that section of it. Right. Is it the PCO2 or is it the hydrogen ion concentration? That also is a very controversial topic. Okay, we'll talk to y'all later. Peace out. See you tomorrow. Don't forget, tomorrow, 5 o'clock, same time, same channel, Vicki Carlisle.